Good evening, everyone. Can, uh, Matthew, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you all for perfect. joining. Uh, we have attendees from all over the country, and it is great. We have this amazing technology that allows us to have this webcast live. And speaking of amazing technology, innovations in tech is one of the main topics tonight, led by Matthew Bartolini from State Street. He is the head of research, uh, Spiders Exchange Traded Funds. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great. And we also actually have the CEO of North America's for Beluga, Sergey Kutcher. Beluga is one of the highest quality spirits in the world. And I know there are many fans of Beluga Vodka in the audience. So it is great. It is with great pressure to welcome you as well, Sergey. Hello, Stefan. How are you? Great. So, Matthew, it will be great to start off the session with you. This year has been challenging to say the least for many reasons, and it led to people's interaction with technology to be so different over the year. Could you provide us with a brief overview of what has changed and what why investors should focus innovation in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, our daily routines have, have massively changed. And I think it, even how we're communicating today, you know, normally in, in sort of pre-COVID times, this would be over, you know, some form of restaurant and, and not, you know, from my, my home and all of your homes, uh, through a, a, a web teleconferencing system. So I think that has just drastically changed a lot of the behaviors. Now, technological innovation is going to touch upon many different industries. Uh, we are seeing this with obviously the need for contactless, contactless interactions, particularly around mobile payments. I mean, I, I honestly don't remember the last time I actually used uh, paper money to pay for anything. I mean, we're, typically most everything is through you know, forms of like Apple Pay uh, or using some form of electronic chip within your credit card. So mobile payments are becoming just a massive industry. Uh, obviously, new industries like telehealth, uh, e-printing has become massive. Uh, these are behaviors that are changing that are unlikely to abate as a result of any form of COVID-19 vaccine uh, that is on its way. Uh, we are developing new behaviors. I think that needs to be appreciated when we think about the opportunities that technological innovations have in a post-COVID world. Uh, I think first and foremost, though, so COVID-19 obviously is a humanitarian crisis, but because now we are living more of our lives in a digital sense, in a digital world, it has also resembled a cybersecurity event. You know, we are now transferring massive amounts of data over the internet in a unstructured manner some, in some cases, but also where we're using video conferencing apps that have never had to handle this type of um, bandwidth. And we obviously have seen some comp uh, compromising of uh, web conferencing apps. You know, I myself actually in the, in the last two months, a lot of my accounts were actually hacked. Uh, luckily it was just the family Spotify account and Netflix account, um, so it wasn't too severe. But that is becoming more of the norm. Cybersecurity is becoming a really important part. But also, if we think about what it takes to get back into the office. Now, State Street Global Advisors, we have started to let some form of employees go back into the office. Uh, I myself obviously have not. I'm, I'm in, this, in this nice room that I have uh, called my office for the better part of nine months. I've become uh, very used to the Larry Bird picture behind me, uh, some form of inspiration, I guess. But you know, when we go back into the office, we actually have to have a um, tracking device to allow people to know where we are in terms of the zones to allow for social distancing. Uh, there's also more infrastructure within our building to identify where people are moving and going so we can actually prevent sort of cross-contamination of different departments. That type of cybersecurity or intelligent infrastructure is something that is not going to go away just a result of a form of a vaccine. Uh, these are, di again, different behaviors. Now, some of these trends had existed prior to the pandemic. We had obviously got, seen an increase in connected devices. So back in, I think, 2010, many uh, individuals or homes, they had about five connected devices. Now, individuals have 10. I mean, again, I'm, I'm in a very, very small room here in my house. And I have, you know, easily seven different connected devices to a Wi-Fi, uh, let alone what my, my kids need uh, to get to their um, 
their school studies done and the iPads and, and all those things. Now, when we look out on the horizon, we have, you know, the U.S. household has about 10 connected devices. Uh, if we project that out to 2024, it's projected that in, uh, households in the United States will have 20 different connected devices, whether that's thermostats or lights, plants, uh, or other forms of sort of daily uh, conveniences. Also, the amount of storage or data volume has increased. In the last five years, so prior to the pandemic, obviously, data volumes increased by about 163%. It's expected that data volumes are to increase by 264%, again, as many of these connected devices come online, but a lot of the intelligent infrastructure that allows people to go back into work or have mobile payments, that is going to increase. It's going to increase the need for cybersecurity, for data storage, for every sort of stretch of the imagination where we now are living in a more digitally connected and physically separate world. Even if we can return some form of normalcy, you know, for instance, I've heard stories of, you know, uh, people going to, to restaurants where uh, their, their menus are now delivered to them digitally. They basically scan their, take their phone out and hold it over a, um, a code and it pops up a menu. You know, this type of innovation happens only if you have an event that punctures the equilibrium of social norms and changes behaviors in a, in a societal sea change. And I think that's what we're undergoing. And it really requires investors to understand really how, how big the ramifications are. Because the innovations that we are seeing are touching every form of industry, even things as like clean energy and power con uh, conservation. I myself, you know, when I go on my daily runs, I see a lot of different uh, uh, houses now installing solar panels, you know, because we have transferred the energy conservation needs from the corporation to the consumer. And, and an efficient form of energy production is through renewable energy. It's much more cost efficient, uh, particularly over the last decade, we've seen severe gains in that space. So all of these things are changing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the butterfly effect that it's had on a lot of social behaviors. Thank you for that fantastic overview. And in terms of you know, technology and looking at the different sectors, you know, obviously performance-wise this year, it's been uh, very interesting to say the least to see how technology has performed well this year, you know, unsurprisingly, and certain sectors like oil has not, you know, down 40 or yeah. 50%. And just looking at all of that, given that we're talking about innovations in tech, how does one define innovation? And within one of the funds that we use at Spider is the XITK. You know, how do you how does that being all being broken down? Because one of the things that we look at is rules based methodology here at RBW mm -hmm. that's uh, produced good results now and also in the future as well. So how does that all break it down to show you know, what's an innovative company and how does that get included? as part of the investment. Yeah, I mean, that's actually been, uh, obviously, without, goes without saying, a quite incredible year. Um, you know, from a sector perspective returns, if we just look at the broad-based nature of it, like you said, energy is down. It's actually been its worst drawdown of all time. Uh, go all the way back uh, to the you know, 1950s. I think that's just is a, a semblance of how um, social behavior has changed sort of consumer demand uh, with that. But when we start to try to think about how do you classify innovation, first of all, it happens beyond the large cap stocks. Disruption happens further down the cap spectrum. So you need to have a process that is exhaustive. Now, as you mentioned, the fund that we have, XITK, um, we start with a very broad unit, so that breadth, that that ability to select from a large pool of securities is helpful in finding innovation because we are just confined to the mega cap stocks. We would likely miss out on some of these firms that are more entrepreneurial, taking risks, that are more focused on one specific or specific line of business. You know, obviously you see Microsoft Teams, it's web conferencing, it's, it's interactive, it's, it's group work. Um, but a, a company like Slack, which recently just is uh, potentially being bought out by Salesforce, all they did was sort of workforce, workforce management, right? Um, so we want to see to try to get some more focus. Now, 
So we want to first an exhaustive list of securities. So we look at anything that's listed in the in the U.S. So um, that can include uh, American depository receipts. So companies that are domiciled in China that list on the U.S. exchange. XITK, 10% of it's from Chinese firms uh, that are domiciled in China, but they have shares listed on the U.S. Uh, exchange. So that exhaustive list is helpful. Now, we also don't want to confine ourselves just to the large cap stocks. We want to have large and small all well represented because, again, disruption happens beyond the core investment of the city S&P 500. Now, to drive focus, um, <clears throat> what we do is we utilize uh, the fact set revere revenue classification codes. Uh, we do not go to the top level for the first level. There's basically, we all go down to the fifth level of revenue classification. So we're going to use a company like FireEye, uh, which does cybersecurity. Uh, they're classified as technology, then infrastructure technology, then software, then network, and then network security. So we want to actually look at firms in that fifth level, that very de the, the depth of where they're to find revenue. And we want to see what firms at that fifth level are generating 50% of their revenue from there, that specific product line. So where these firms have a unique focus. Um, so another company like Zoom. Zoom is classified obviously as technology and then goes down to the software and software servicing. Um, but when we look at a really a nuanced and granular revenue classification, they're they are a, a home and corporate communications firm. And we see that they generate obviously more than 50%. So we are looking for firms in that very granular space of a revenue classification that generate more than 50% of their own revenue from that one product line. Then we basically group uh, all those firms into those sectors. We find then basically which sort of that fifth level industry has the highest amount of revenue growth. We take basically the top 25% of all the industries that we look at and we weight all of the stocks in that top 25% of the industries equally. Now, obviously some, you know, maybe perhaps some firms are double counted. We have to remove those out so they don't have twice eight. But basically we look for that very nuanced and granular revenue approach where firms are very specific about what their business operations are, but also where they have the highest revenue growth. So we're, out, we're scale, we're bringing those, those industries by revenue growth. So we wanna find companies that are focused, that, are high, that have, offer high revenue growth, and then we equal weight them. In a, in a strategy like this, where we're trying to harness the breadth of innovative technologies, we do not want to take on what we refer to as idiosyncratic risk, which is basically stock-specific risk. So if we were to weight by some form of metric of innovation, and perhaps that you know, the, the metric we've identified led to a company XYZ being the top weight, now, they might be the most innovative company, have high revenue growth, but all of a sudden there's a corporate accounting scandal or there's an event within their company that is you know, a left tail or out of nowhere. We don't want that to disrupt all of the innovation that we're trying to harness throughout the rest of the strategy. So in these thematic ETFs, they're harnessing nuance and granular growth opportunities where companies are really honed in on one specific product line that is you know, really disrupting our behaviors. We want to equal weight that. We don't want to have one stock to really upend the apple cart. So that's really how we think about classifying and pursuing innovation at State Street. Well, that's that's great. That really good overview. And on that note, there's two things that really resonated with me. One is looking at companies with not just good revenue, but also growing revenue. So one correct. of the things as part of our investment committee, a lot of us are CPAs. And you know, it's great that you mentioned that. Obviously, it's not just about technology companies or innovative companies, but how do we actually capture companies that are growing in revenue? So you know, thank you for featuring that. And in terms of also the sector breakdown, a lot of clients find it interesting that with one of the most popular sector funds out there in the tech world, it includes companies like Visa and also MasterCard. Now, can you yeah. speak to that a little bit why uh, certain companies like that. A lot of people guess financial services, for example. And so how no. 
yeah. why investors should really you know think about understanding what they hold further because you know a lot of times it comes as a surprise yeah so it's interesting um visa and mastercard are are not actually financial companies um, they're technology companies so visa and mastercard do not actually extend any credit to anybody um it's usually done through a bank and uh this different than american express american express actually extends credit uh visa and mastercard do not for instance i have a, a mastercard account in barclays is who i pay every month um and uh we've been paying them a lot because amazon likes to deliver here uh quite frequently during the pandemic um and so they are basically a technology solution that has a tech stack that sits on their sort of corporate financing operations. And so they're not actually, you know, extending any credit. They are a technology servicing company that is really, you know, also innovating within mobile payments. So they would be classified as a technology company. And, and, and it's really sort of jarring to think about that because you just think everyone is a credit card company. But, you know, in actuality, there's a massive difference between American Express Visa and MasterCard, when you dig into their corporate operations. And I think when we're starting to class through innovation and trying to understand where firms are maybe specializing in mobile payments, you know, you, you start to see some companies that maybe may not make sense because you thought they were, you know, within a, a you know, sort of a sleepy old credit card industry. Um, so, yeah, I think it is, it is really instructive to know what you own. And I think in some cases, in these innovative thematic funds that dive deeper than the top line, that don't just own the Google and the Netflix, uh, you you really want to you know, work with a firm uh, like our, ourselves that knows a lot about these companies that are going in there. Um, you know, for instance, uh, one of the the top companies, obviously, um, is Zoom uh, within uh, XITK, uh, but there's also Digital Turbine, which is a company. Uh, that specializes in, you know, web face, web interfacing applications. Uh, their ticker is APPS, actually. Uh, and they've seen a phenomenal rise in revenue projections as a result of the pandemic. And just being able to provide that next level insight of like, you know, what do these firms actually do? Uh, we, I had a conversation earlier with a client today about some of the stocks within, uh, XITK. And we're able to really dive in deep of like, well, why would this be included and why, you know, would some other firms not be? So again, you know, working with a partner like ourselves is helpful because we can really go deep and provide that next level information on particularly why a company may be included and, and why one might be ex excluded. Perfect. And obviously Zoom uh, has been one of the most talked about companies. I think I've seen you on CNBC talk about it. And a couple of other questions, maybe featuring companies like DocuSign. It's more important than ever, like uh, for DocuSign to be in existence, first of all. Uh, we've always yeah. used quite a bit in our office, but more than ever, it's become so prevalent in terms of just getting any, any official documents done. And also, can you speak to a little bit more about what are some of the innovative companies that you see now that might potentially get included into XITK and also talking about why it will be done in a very tax efficient manner? Uh, in that particular instance sure so i mean i can't really speak to what we may be including uh only because you know that'd be providing information that is, is not really publicly available uh so i don't want to get myself into any, any any trouble there um from the index rebalance that comes out but you know with the etf constructs there's a lot of tax efficiencies built in uh, first and foremost it's just sort of take a very quick etf 101 uh course right here uh, not all trades that go through the secondary market. So when you guys buy shares of XITK, it goes into the secondary market to a market maker on the New York Stock Exchange. They buy and sell the shares. Uh, there might be existing volume out there. XITK is a decent amount of volume that trades every day. So, you know, you buy 100 shares or what have you, that can be fulfilled because a market maker has that in inventory. Uh, if they do not, they come to us and say, hey, we need to create, you know, 10,000 shares to meet this order. Uh, we'll say, great. Send us the securities in the in the fund. Here's the list of 100 of them. There's only about 96 uh, actually in the fund. They'll give them to us and we'll give them shares. Now they'll deliver that to us in kind. And that's a tax uh, efficient manner of delivering securities. And if someone wants to redeem up, let's say you guys, you know, you've, you're, 
you know, rebalancing your fund and you're saying, hey, you've gone up a lot. Let's you know, tr trim some of the position back to you know some form of weight or what have you. Or if there's a client event that needs some liquidity, uh, you redeem your 10,000 shares and a market maker will come out to us and say, hey, we need want to want to give you back these 10,000 shares. Well, like, great. Here's the securities that make up those 10,000 shares. Market maker XYZ, go sell them as you may. And we'll deliver those out in kind. And that's a tax, there's no taxes associated with that transaction because of the in kind nature of it. So it's a really tax efficient wrapper in itself. And as a result, it, it, it leads to a low amount of capital gains that are paid. In fact, State Street Spider ETF this year, there only three funds pay capital gains. Uh, if you think to the mutual fund industry, uh, last year, in 2019, we don't have the full 2020 numbers, I believe it was somewhere around 60% of mutual funds take capital gains. And in the large cap core blend space, it was 90%. So the fact that only three of our funds this year paid capital gains, I think, goes to show the sort of tax efficient nature of the ETF because the in-kind redemption, um, in-kind, sorry, creation redemption mechanism, which we would be more than happy to go far more in depth than the, the five minute or 50 second um, 101 course I just tried to deliver. Thank you. And on that note, um, just more of a general question you know, with the upcoming vaccine, uh, that, that's one mm -hmm. of the most you know, asked questions these days. And what are you seeing in terms of the potential economic impact? And also um, on that note, getting a little more granular after that, how that would affect technology companies, because one of the thought process there is with the vaccine being uncertain in the past, that's allowed technology companies to perform really well. But now that there's a potential vaccine coming around the corner, how would that affect technology companies in the future? Yeah. So our, our main feeling around the vaccine's impact on the market and the economy is, and how that should relate to portfolio considerations is that investors heading in 2021, should seek to barbell that cyclical and secular change. You know, as a result of vaccine, we're likely to see an increase in economic growth. Uh, we're likely to see a reopening of economies. Uh, we're likely to see you know companies get back to some form of normalcy. Uh, and that should lead to a more cyclical recovery. We've already started to see that. You know, for instance, bank stocks uh, had some of their best returns in November since the 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 depth of the GFC, the Great, great Financial Crisis. So you should sort of position a bit for that cyclical recovery. But I think it should not be lost on anyone that we are still dealing with the evolution of societal behaviors. So we've actually started to use this phrase that is not only just a recovery or an evolution, but a recovolution. Uh, because we are still dealing with the societal behavioral changes that the pandemic has caused that still will require the need for these innovative technology solutions. So we will still have the need for video conferencing. We, we are seeing companies. Uh, there's a study from plays out today that you know, asked, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,500 different senior leaders uh, throughout the economy and what their return to office plans were. And 60% of them said that uh, the majority of their firm would still be working remote even after the pandemic is, is over. So, just because we have a vaccine, it does not mean that everything will return back to normal. And some of these firms that are on the forefront of innovation and technologies, whether it's through intelligent infrastructure, connected devices, uh, social media apps, messaging devices, you know, uh, you really workforce collaboration enterprise systems. So like a Slack technologies or a DocuSign, those are going to start to be less sort of technology discretionary items and more technology staples, much in the way that, you know, we all are now proficient in Excel and Microsoft Word and PowerPoint. You know, we're going to have to become proficient in Slack or in Microsoft Teams or, you know, how to use a WebEx or a Zoom. Uh, so I think in our view, as we head to 2020, because this evolution is still occurring, but we may have a cyclical economic recovery, you should try to barbell that and may, you know, date portions of your portfolio towards cyclical assets like banks, because we're likely to see a higher uh, uh, interest rate environment and it typically has been constructive, but also because the growth long-term in the economy is going to come from these innovative companies. We decompose the expected three to five year EPS earnings growth of firms within XITK 
They're expected to grow their bottom line over the next three to five years by an annual rate of around 35%. The broader U.S. equity market by a measure of the S&P 500 is expected to grow by 12%. And that's even with you know, the, the, as, the um, aspect of the COVID-19 vaccine news. And again, a lot of this is uncertain. We had a once in a lifetime event, we're gonna have a once in a lifetime recovery. In our view, we should barbell that cyclical and secular change because this is not just a recovery, it's also an evolution of how we've performed our daily routines. Other will learn how to use some of the, the video conferencing tools, but you know, I think it's forcing a lot of people to be innovative. So in one aspect, yeah. that, that definitely helped. And we just have a couple of minutes left. So I just want to ask you one last question. We're getting some great questions from the audience. And one question we had was, you know, how do we think about technology in China? Obviously, looking international, there's a lot of good innovative companies out there. Um, and obviously, some of the holdings are within within China. So, you know, what mm -hmm. are your thoughts on that and their selection process and its outlook? Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we as a firm are constructive on Chinese equity. Um, I think there's a couple of things to the advantage for the region. Um, one is you know, if we look at just case rates, they, they are uh, better than a lot of the Western nations. Um, there's also the aspect of the Biden-Harris administration, uh, which would likely be less hawkish towards a China trade relationship, or at least uh, more predictable from that manner uh, with respect to tariffs and also diplomatic associates. Uh, that is likely to lead to, you know, stronger growth prospects in China. The world economic outlook already is projecting that in 2021, China is expected to grow GDP growth by around, I think, 8.1%, which is essentially five percentage points higher than what the U.S. is projected to be. You, you know, also have the likelihood of a, a U.S.-China trade pact that, again, is less confrontational and, and more diplomatic. Uh, from that perspective, so that can improve sentiment. But you also have the Regional Economic Cooperation Pact that was recently signed by uh, Southeast Asian nations, covering about, I think, 30 trillion in global domestic product. And that's likely to be a benefit towards that region to open up free trade. So I think China overall is constructive. Now, Chinese technology firms, they have been at the forefront of a lot of the, the trade negotiations, whether it's Huawei or ZTE. And I think there was some recent news that came out, um, you know, I think literally an hour ago about Huawei um, and, and sort of trying to reach agreement. I think one of their senior leaders, um, who knows what that would happen. But there are firms that, you know, have to adhere to U.S. listing standards. And I think that's really important because U.S. listing standards are a little bit more um, strict than uh, within China. There's some requirements. Now, there's a bill within Congress to make those requirements strict. I think it's is, is supportive from a consumer perspective or an investor perspective because they have to adhere to more stricter, even stricter listeners than they have now in something to the degree that a typical U.S. company would, right? So revealing sort of accounting and so what have you. So you know, these Chinese firms that are listing on the, on the New York Stock Exchange, they're allowed to be within our strategy that we have. And I think more strict standards uh, in terms of revealing their accounting books and records is helpful, but also it allows investors to tap into a market where technology is really at the forefront of transforming the Chinese economy from a manufacturing base to service base. You know, there's you, you know, we obviously had um, uh, the removal of the Ant Financial IPO as a result of some concerns around the structure of that firm. You know, I think that is is helpful in providing more confidence into chinese equities uh, if that was a, a firm that was going to list in the us you know we, we'd, we'd probably have more uh confidence in the books and accounting records as well so i think overall chinese equities you know that are in, that are in innovative front of technology are helpful for long-term growth i think if they're listed in the us there's a little bit more confidence there that um from an accounting perspective they are not um you know, I don't want to speak out of turn, but there's a little bit more confidence in the books and records associated with these because of the listing standards within the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and the, and the Securities Exchange Commission. And those standards are likely to improve uh, based on some legislation that's working through the books. Uh, that's great to hear. Given that we are born out of a CPA firm, better, <laughs> better uh, accounting books is always uh, good to hear.
And Matthew, thank you so much as always. Thank you greatly for your wisdom. And uh, this concludes our innovative and in technology session. And we always just focus on sound rules-based methodology investment funds you know, that really makes sense now and really focusing on factors that outperform over time. So it's always a pleasure to have you, Matthew. Thank you so much. Thank you.